advanced purple teaming. I do a lot of crazy things at a lot of places. I think most of you know that. All right, our agenda. So who saw Ed Scotus's keynote, right? Wow, all those hands in the room. It's, it's glad to have such a packed room here. They don't know at home. It's like one person in the room. I'm teasing. So Ed talked about during a, at his keynote that a keynote's purpose is not to do the technical deep dive, not to throw the technical knowledge, but to broaden your thinking, to bring new ideas to bear. And so when I first submitted this talk, I'll be, I'll be honest, I was really kind of torn between do I wanna show some deep dives of some different things on techniques at a technical level that allow you to drive a lot of the behavioral and procedural change that we need to really grow? Or do I wanna to start to share more of the ideas on how we expand and make this more useful? Um, as he said in the introduction, I've been doing this for a long time. I was doing this before it was called purple teaming. And how I first arrived at this is I came into the space from the offensive side and red teaming. And I was disappointed at the way I saw us performing red team as an industry. We were doing a lot of things that I would call out as ego driven. And years ago, when I started giving those talks, let's just say it was not well received. Turns out people don't like to be called out on the things that they're doing wrong. But we as an industry were not meeting the business needs. And so when I was putting this talk together, I was sort of stuck in that same evolution of, do I continue to push the technical stuff that we've been talking about? Or do I try to think of some ideas to expound, expand the boundaries of how we think about this problem? Uh, for those of you who caught my keynote at Hackfest last year, what I did for that was that same idea as the keynote there, where I looked at, we have a leadership and a management challenge in security. And the way I approached it in that keynote last year is there are basically three ways of managing. Everybody's familiar with the managing down, but there's two other ways of managing that help us in a purple team way to expand what we can do in security by educating the business and supporting the business as we go. And part of that is managing sideways and part of that is managing up. So managing sideways, working with our peers, security champions program, managing up different ways to make it that we're more focused on the business. And so this talk is going to be driving innovation with different ways to manage sideways and to manage up as opposed to technically going into a deep dive. So. This is very complicated. We're going to go through it very quickly because we only have so much time. So the evolving state of security testing. I think everybody has seen this. This is something that George Ochias and I have been talking about for several years. The biggest change that we came around is originally we had the red team before the purple team. And something that we have found in the last two years of going out and working with industry is that purple teaming really comes before red teaming because there's enough tooling now that it can be done earlier. Blue teams through things like Atomic Red Team can drive their own red team behaviors in simple ways that doesn't require the more complicated red team to get the process off the ground. So purple team really has two aspects to it. One, the process maturity to run the purple team itself. The second is the technical capability that supports what the purple team can do. And there's enough available now that that purple team is something that should start earlier because it helps build a stronger blue team. I haven't seen a purple team exercise where anybody didn't come out and say, wow, I learned something from it. Big Andy. Shirt match, dude, you get, it. you get stickers for that. One of the other things we learned from a purple team is that we adjust as we go, and it is way too hot in this room to do the purple unicorn. So I'm calling an audible, which is what you're allowed to do during a purple team. You're not locked in to what you agreed to beforehand. So let's get on the same page. Andy, since you just walked in, what is a purple team? So what Andy said was the traditional answer, right? Red and blue doing detection validation. Well, I'd like to give you a different definition that expands on that because that's part of the innovation that we're gonna be looking at here. The traditional definition is red and blue working together. Red, I define the TTPs from the threat intelligence. Blue, I'm doing what can I have visibility on and what can I detect? And what I would argue is it's actually a collaborative milestone driven process. It is different functions working together of which the core is red and blue. We can bring any business function into that conversation. And then it's a milestone driven process, right? We're still using the techniques or the signals that we're trying to drive to learn from. But if you start to already think about how this expands the possibility, we're not just doing simple detection validation. We can now start to bring in other business benefits into our purple team. 
So we all know the purple team process. So what are the outcomes of a purple team exercise? You already said detection validation. Anybody have anything else to add? Mike, I can just start you awkwardly. Okay, but that's not an outcome, right? That's a signal that I'm driving to learn an outcome. And that's important because if you remember in the summary, I talked about Six Sigma, right? We're looking at process. Purple team process is an F of X equals X plus Y, right? X is that outcome plus sub sigma around what the outcome is. One of those X's is detection validation. What could be another one? Shorter feedback loops for intelligence. Yeah, actually, could you hand him the mic? Because I, I want to, that's a great idea. Can you expound on that? Yeah, is this, this is on, okay. Shorter feedback loops for intelligence. So for example, um, you know, rather than having a red team go through this entire process and then like ex just researching or uh, analyzing the results of like, say one different op, uh, you know, purple teams can kind of broaden that and also hasten it. Yep. So you can run through multiple different emulations or you can run on like incredibly deep or incredibly broad emulations to be able to like analyze that much quicker than either like a real world attack or red team op. Yeah. In my so two things to pull out of what you said in summary. Uh, one, the educational component of where we are training blue on the threat as we're doing it, which I think is a huge benefit that we missed from the old days, right? The old days, red team would do the black box approach. They would do something. They'd come back and say, hey, I know you already have 40 hours of work. We found a whole bunch of problems. See you later. And then they'd be like, well, how did you do that? Like, what, what exactly did you do? And a lot of red teams were like, well, I'm not sharing that with you because then I can't do it again which defeats the point. The second is threat intelligence is a $10 billion industry, plus or minus, of stale IOCs, right? What does threat intelligence primarily give us? We get two kinds of threat intelligence. We get the bottom of the pyramid of pain, which is this domain, this IP, this file signature, which we knew were bad six months ago, but by the time it gets to the analytic loop, here you go now. And that's machine readable, which is why it's what we live on. And then we have those wonderful threat analyst reports, right? We had cyber work on last week where they gave that kind of in-depth detail and intel, which is great because that's what gets us on the behavioral components to be able to catch attack chains next time. But you shorten that loop with the purple team piece because you're bringing in that top of the pyramid of pain into an operational way that we can actually use. But the other part of it is metrics. Right? Management likes metric. Business likes metrics. And the problem we have in security is there are no metrics that survive tomorrow from a measurement of security purely. And so we get two kinds of metrics, which I'll touch on in a couple of slides here. But fundamentally, we're getting an outcome of the process and we're getting snapshots that we can build upon. And if we're able to automate our purple team, then it allows us to establish that plateau that we keep. And over time, and I've talked about this previously, what I call it is you start to find your number. Now, the limitation is that we tend to focus that number solely on technical controls. And one of the things I liked in the answers you gave is you actually, and I don't think you meant to, but you talked about time. Time is the other component. The end of the day, how an attacker is able to succeed is the speed that they're able to accomplish their operations before we're able to catch them. That's called time to breakout. And that's not something we're measuring enough in this industry. I haven't seen anybody focused on that yet. So start to think about a lot of these things as aspirational. This is where we can get once we have a solid purple team working with those metrics over time. And then of course, this is also a great way if we have our purple team focused correctly and we start bringing more of those cross-functional elements in that we can begin to speak to the business because the business does not speak security. They don't want to, it's not their job. And I'm not gonna say which one of these is business in this picture. So why we measure? The first is compliance. Does anybody think that compliance is security? No, nope, this is an expert group, right? Compliance is not security. Compliance is the existential foundation that a business operates on. Without that checklist being all checked, they literally cannot do business. Security is the work you put on top of it. That's where the threat intelligence piece comes in. And of course, how we do it wrong. Take a moment, because I thought this was really funny.
This is what happens when the business misunderstands security. This is where purple teaming is a great way to continue to build that process-driven approach to continuing to facilitate and educate, not just red and blue, but also educate business components along with it. So one of the areas where I think we get metrics wrong is phishing. This is the best example I like to, to give. And I, I can remember years ago, I was having a conversation with the CISO and he had just started the classic, we're doing phishing awareness training, right? We're gonna beat up our users for doing something wrong. Let's just take a sidestep there. If a user clicking something can burn down your enterprise, you have bad security. It's not the user's fault. Hopefully everybody gets that. But the metrics that we were using, and this is his story, is he was like, hey, we baselined ourselves and we had 32% clicks. We did six months of training. We smacked users around left and right. And at the end of it, we were at 27%. And he's patting himself on the back because for the first time, and this, is, this really gives you an executive and business insight. I'm not picking on the CISO, but it shows you what's driving them. He just was so happy to finally have a number that he could go to the business and be like, I'm a big boy like the rest of you. But the number didn't matter. Any number above zero is a failure. And here's the trick, we will never get to zero. So metrics tell a story, but we need to make sure we're using the right metrics to tell that story. Otherwise we get caught in this loop where again, we're pitting ourselves in an adversarial way against the users versus an adversarial way against the threat who really is our concern. So the NIST framework. NIST framework has four different maturity categories, right? I have partial security implemented, basically YOLO. Uh, I have risk informed. It means we're aware there's security, but we don't really care. Um, and then there's repeatable. And this is another area where I think we go sideways. We get so focused on the process aspect. Because now again, we're able to generate metrics. I can measure my process. Again, recognizing that process, like ISO 9001, 27001, 20,000, those are all process-driven frameworks that we can measure and we can establish different levels of maturity, but the metrics to them become the snake eating the snake. It's a way of assuring a certain outcome. It doesn't necessarily assure compliance. It's, I mean, excuse me, uh, protection. <laughs> So it's like compliance. So truth and security. Summary here from Dan Gear. Adversarial procedures is the best way to measure it. Turns out security is defined by the threat. What makes it so difficult for the business is that the previous ways that we've looked at business continuity planning, disaster recovery, which is their way of having understood a threat, right? Like the weather. Ed, you already missed it. I quoted you earlier. <laughs> yeah, no, so I was talking about in your, in your keynote how uh, a keynote's idea is meant to like innovate and drive ideas, which is also the inspiration for what we're doing here. So you led right into it. And thank you for joining us. Um, I forgot, but Ed Scotus, Adversarial Procedures, that's our goal. Thank you, Dan Gear. All right, so security is defined by the threat. Now, my favorite part of this joke is you'll notice even the AK-47 is Adidas branded. You can laugh, these are funny. But this is what your threat really looks like. One, from a technical replication, you are never going to spend as much money as, or time as they are to accomplish the goal, which is why we do things like assume compromise. It's why you can, what I call technically cheat to accomplish a goal. If I'm, a test, if I'm testing application allow listing, run a, run a few .exes, validate that allow list or deny list works the way you expect it to, then allow list your purple team exercise to take the next step. It's the equivalent of a lot of work from here accomplishing something you know they can accomplish. But the bigger takeaway here is your stack, your technical stack, your defensive stack, is their test matrix. And anybody who's ever done offensive testing in here, the most fun you can ever have is when you break into some place through the defensive tool sets, right? Hey, thanks McAfee for giving me access. Every piece of code contributes to an exponential attack surface for vulnerability. Okay. I am required to say MITRE attack at least once during this presentation or MITRE will find me. 
See, all right, we're laughing at some of the jokes, that's okay. If this were the answer, this would be a short presentation. So what is MITRE ATT&CK? It's a framework, right? All frameworks are wrong, some are just more useful. The problem with this framework is it's brilliant. And anything that's brilliant and simple, we misuse. We get focused on shading in boxes, getting them green, making them check boxes. And here's why, because we're using it incorrectly. Because what it actually is, is a periodic table. Each technique in there represents an atomic element. And you don't test atomic elements as atoms. I mean, atomic red team, that's what they do. It's a great start. The challenge is you're going to find that you have to grow from atomic red team. It's a good beginning for a purple team, but it's not the end for a purple team. And I've seen this time and time again, where folks come in and they're testing hydrogen, and then they're testing oxygen. And guess what? The attacker is water. Yeah, I'm still hydrogen and oxygen, but the chemical equation of being together is what breaks your controls. We talk about detection validation and detection engineering. Building simple ones on atomic rule sets isn't going to get you very far. For example, credential theft is my favorite. Hey, I stole your credentials, yes or no? No, that's not how an attacker uses your credentials. An attacker is using your credentials to do something with it. It changes the state of the attack. My ability to move laterally is different if I have credentials to move laterally or if I don't. That's going to leave a different fingerprint on your network. Host and network is gonna look different. That's water versus testing for hydrogen and oxygen. So it's a good place to start to test atomic elements, but a mature purple team needs to grow from atomic testing to combining those in many different ways, because you're gonna, that's how you build an effective behaviorally focused detection set, not just treating it as a bingo card. So the cyber defense matrix. Uh, Sunil Yu is one of the smartest folks I've ever met in cybersecurity. And about five years ago at the RSA conference, he unveiled us this idea called the cyber defense matrix. I don't get a commission for this, but he also just wrote a book on it this year. Basically what he's saying is he takes the five phases of the NIST CSF at the top, identification, prevention, detection, response, and remediation, recover, against all of the asset categories you have, right? Including users, because users are the largest risk surface of an organization. And then we can break that down to left and right of boom. Left of boom is structural awareness. This is what I know about myself. Operational awareness is what I know about what is the behaviors that are happening on my environment. Before you do a purple team, take the five minute exercise to sketch out what you believe your coverage is across these categories of products, people, process, and the outsourced services that you have. Before you even do the purple team, you can immediately identify where you have gaps because the starting point to a purple team is validating that visibility. I can't detect something if I can't even see it. And if I don't have the high level coverage, then it's not going to detect it. So before I've even started on keyboard, I can immediately begin to assess what my gaps are or where I have overlap that maybe I want to understand and deconflict that overlap. But this should be the scope of your purple team is understanding the holes and the overlap and then validating those and building them. I get asked all the time, how do I pick a vendor? What about this vendor? What about that vendor? There's only two components to picking a vendor. First is trust. I think we've all reached enough in our career to recognize this is a people to people game. When I teach OT, I talk about the first thing you need to do is build a relationship with OT. The IT nerds running across me like, hey, we got a problem, isn't the moment to start the conversation. We work on relationships. This is not a technical game, it's a people game. Okay, so breaking that down, I simplify this into three categories and I'll actually skip this. So I'm simple. I don't like complicated attack frameworks. There's only three areas we really need to think about high level. Reconnaissance, this is where I case the joint. Initial access, this is where I break into the joint. Post access, this is where I make my money. 
and the business value is the highest on the post access space. So when we're looking at ways to talk to the business, this is how we get over the psychological factor that humans do not like to be broken into. We have this, I have talked to so many CISOs, we're like, yeah, I get it, the perimeter is dead, prevention is impossible, and yet that's gonna be the primary thing that I'm gonna invest my budget in because the psychological factor is there. Why would I let somebody in, no matter the fact that you can't prevent it? It is impossible. It's a question of when, not if. We all understand that, but it's a lot easier for us to have a conversation like this in a classroom than be the person in the hot seat with the career longevity of a mayfly. It was a CISO joke. I can also do this when you wanna know what the jokes are. But the business value is higher in the post-access space. Here's also the good news. This is where you can turn the tables on the attacker. An attacker cannot work on assets that you don't have. An attacker cannot communicate with those assets and protocols you do not have organic to your environment. Think about that. Short of the fact that shadow IT is a thing, which is an identification problem, they can only work on what you have and they can only talk the way that you already speak. You have control in the post-access environment. The trick is figuring out how do we constrain that and have enough confidence that we know what we have and we know how it speaks. And that's part of where I was talking about it as we're driving signal into this environment because that's how we chip away at the marble to leave that beautiful statue of David, which is what our you know, aspiration is for our detection engineering. So we have lots of tools to help us. Anyone feel better? Nope, right? Goes back to the vendor problem. One is building that trust with them. The second is our investment in making the vendor ours. 25% of tools are purchased and put on the shelf. They're probably the safest. 25% are installed with default configurations, which means I don't even have to work to get in. And then 25% are installed and not tuned correctly. They're misconfigured. They're not maintained. We have to make the tools ours. This is where the purple team brings that business value, again, on the post-access side with not just building the detection validations, but proving protection, proving the detection, and then the people aspect of the response with it. So we're gonna start with the first phase, which is identify. Configuration management database. Who has one that actually works? Only had one time I've ever had this conversation in class that anybody ever raised their hand. So I never talk about this because it completely takes away from my super elite hacker creds. I actually built a global CMDB about 20 years ago. It took four years, took 12 people. And how I was able to convince the business is I didn't tie it to the security and the configurations. I tied it directly to money savings because a fully functional CMDB highlights lots of repeatability or sorry, like commonality and overlap in assets and licenses and gives you the strength to be able to negotiate at a global scale. I saved that company over $4 million annually by getting the CFO to buy into the plan. And with that, we were able to continue to advance it and use it as a way to bring all of these disparate acquisitions. I mean, I went to offices around the world where they'd been bought 15 years ago and they still had the old logo up front. They didn't even acknowledge they were part of the new corporate overlord. And I was like the first corporate person to ever show up there and be like, hey, so uh, welcome to the game. And the GM would look at me and be like, who are you? What? I'm not doing that. Tying into procurement. That's how you do it. Okay, so quality assurance. Security is basically business assurance. We were talking earlier about process frameworks. This is how the business thinks about all the other things they do. The hard part we have with security is that our security process framework leads to an outcome that we can't effectively measure against the threat. But it's the kind of thing that we can if we focus on those behavioral aspects over time. So looking at this within the identification piece, I would argue that vulnerability management scanners are kind of securities cheat to the fact that we don't have a CMDB we can trust. So we're going and discovering our own assets against those vulnerabilities because we don't have a configuration management database that we can trust. We are customers to IT for that and we kind of get what we get. Well, one of the ways that we can derive additional value is what if we brought in 
CMDB CI audits, so audit and configuration items, into part of what we're measuring. So this leads to kind of a Six Sigma approach. Now, I'm not asking you to go become a Six Sigma black belt. I coincidentally had to go down that track when I had a brief tenure in manufacturing. It was very interesting. You don't need to know all of it. What you do need to know is just a way to statistically sample. So thinking of the fact that I don't trust the CMDB to help me in security, and I'm coming up with these band-aids for it, why not automatically include that to make IT more a part of what security is doing through your purple team exercise? We can do statistical sampling of the configuration management database. So as opposed to our traditional approach of these are just these business functions that we want to test this in, or I only feel confident enough with my purple team to be able to do one or two computers. Why not bring that as a way to sample so that we start to validate the CMDB as naturally the outcome of what we're doing in the purple team process? Sounds like advanced purple teaming to me. Oh wait, that's the title. So who's your best ally for CMDB? I mentioned this, right? Procurement. Procurement is the point that everything, theoretically, gets purchased and brought into the organization. This is the starting point for asset identification, visibility, and control. Again, the attacker can't work on assets that you don't have. Your challenge is just knowing that you have those assets. Procurement is, for the most part, where all of those things are coming in. So protection. So Traditionally, protection is a penetration testing thing. I'm looking at, can I harden a system or can I understand all the ways to gain unauthorized access to that system? And so in, in operation, we're vulnerability scanning, we're doing vulnerability assessments, we're doing penetration testing. We can also start to bring in a level of purple teaming for this. Now, like I said, traditionally, purple teaming is from an assumed compromise perspective because that's where the most business value is. But again, going to the psychology of most executives are in a prevention mindset, being able to incorporate some of that element is valuable. One of the easy ways to do that, so we're going to talk threats versus vulnerabilities, you know all that. I guess my phishing thing is not here, unless it's, oh, wrong button. All right, well, I was going to have a thing on phishing, but so threats versus vulnerabilities, this is a definition slide. Um, advanced vulnerability management is the way that we do protection. Um, in short, there are two aspects to vulnerability management we're missing. Vulnerability management for most of us today is effectively a Sisyphean task of, here's a list of things. It has a generic CVSS rating against it. Typically we have a policy, anything above 8.0, we immediately work on fixing. And then tomorrow there's more on the list. We did something we don't really know if it was effective. And if you look at the statistics, most of the exploitation that does happen, because exploitation is a thing, Patch Tuesday, Exploit Wednesday, is actually between five and eight. Because the attackers know you're focusing on the top things, so they're going through the things that are just below what you're able to tackle. So, I mean, again, they're going to continue to innovate around the constraints that you set. You are impacting them. You are driving their behaviors. The problem is you're driving their behaviors to your blind spot. So, in short, Trying to understand the externality of whether they're weaponizing something, crawling the dark web to see in 16 languages whether that's what the attack is going to be, trying to understand motive and activity. I would suggest that's, those aren't things you can control. If you have the money to spend on it, have fun. But the thing you can control is internal. What are the value of the assets that you have? What is the business impact of those assets? Prioritizing vulnerabilities against things that matter makes your job a lot easier. Not everything in the business is created equally. Here we go. So the other aspect of protection is phishing. Phishing and business email compromise are still the primary initial access method. And so there's two aspects that we can, can draw from this at a high level. There's probably some more. But the first is we can validate payload delivery. If I have anti-phishing mechanisms, if I have DMARC installed, validate those. That is a form of demonstrating that we can measure protection. Now, most folks are going, well, how do I do this in a purple team exercise? Yes, you're not gonna bring everybody in a room and sit there and send email and then wait. So stage it into two parts. 
use the purple team scope to be what are the effective deliveries. Where did somebody click, not to punish the user, but to establish that against that kind of threat in that campaign, that's gonna be the starting point from a business function for the purple team scope. So conduct the phishing exercises, then use that to set the scope for the purple team. Detection. So Chris Peacock, um, who is the number two Sigma contributor in the world, I just think that's so cool, I love bragging about him. He did a poll on Twitter and he talked about what is detection? Detection is when an alert is triggered or when a human picks up the alert. What do you think? Who thinks it's when an alert is triggered? So did I, that's what I voted too. Ed shook his head no, so I'm gonna guess Ed is a part of the, a human picks up the alert. Okay, so Ed, why is it when a human picks up the alert? I literally was just talking about you. And as you can see, we're on your slide. All right, Chris Peacock, who just walked in the room. That was not, that was literally not scripted at all. What was your takeaway from your poll? Uh, so hold on, let me get some situational awareness. Um, detect, detected is when an alert is triggered or a human picks up the alert. So we have multiple areas that we look at here. Is, is it detected by the, the system that we have in place? That's one detection. But what we really need from at least a managerial standpoint is, is does a human pick up an alert? Um, so we, you can define it whichever way you want, but whatever you do for your organization, make sure that you're consistent and make sure that you get to the point where, hey, we have to have some way of communicating that a human got eyes on. Right, so the takeaway is we can have our expert arguments here, right? We've been arguing what red teaming is, what penetration testing is, what OST is, and what's the value of OST, right? We, we uh, emulation versus simulation, I've been in the middle of that one for a number of years. In fact, I think I started that argument. Um, nobody cares. Outside of our echo chamber, nobody cares. The important thing I think is what Chris talked about is that your organization has a common definition for it. And that that definition needs to understand the different levels of detection, whether something's at host, whether something's at host and goes up to a central analysis point, your SIM, whether a human is trained to be able to then act on it. This is the machine to human component. If you remember back on the cyber defense matrix, we had that increasing human component as we went through the phases of an incident response, detection and response. Personally, I like to simplify it as detection is the technical capture of an event that is creates an alert which is thrown to a human and then response is what my definition is of when the human gets involved. Doesn't matter, at the end of the day, your organization needs to pick which one it is so that you're all clear on it. So the second worst feeling in cybersecurity is when you're in the middle of an incident and you go and the logs aren't there. There's a worse feeling than that, but that's a pretty bad one because you're already under the stress of the organization going, oh, this is what we're paying for? And you still got hacked? Because we have that education challenge, we have that communication challenge. And now you're in the middle in a very stressful environment of potential impact to business operations, of a whole bunch of people poking you nonstop, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. And the information you need to answer the question is not there. This is why visibility is an important thing to continue to validate. So that's our starting point for a purple team is we're establishing that visibility. And we can baseline and we can show our improvement in visibility. And being able to benchmark that over time, and this is where the automated component of a purple teaming comes into value because things continue to change in the business. Visibility you had three months ago, is definitely not gonna be the visibility you have today. And so finding that way to, again, with each purple team, one, you have a metric output that you're able to show. In this case, for a simple purple team, it's simply going to be the technical controls over time. You want that to go back to the human response component of it, right? We talked about time earlier. Time is the missing metric that we still are not seeing in purple teams. That's when an advanced purple team needs to start to incorporate because a technical alert doesn't do any good if there's no human re response to it. You could have the best detection controls on the planet. If your folks aren't trained with them and it doesn't, you're not able to validate that piece, it doesn't matter. Nerd solution for nerd problem. It's a people problem. 
So extending this even further, we can do this with our supply chain. Supply chain risk, thank you SolarWinds, thank you Kaseya, has suddenly become a hot button topic. We're here in the Washington DC area. You can't go more than two feet without a government contractor saying either supply chain risk or zero trust networking. They don't know what either of those things mean, but they know they should be concerned about them. You can bring the supply chain in much the same way that we're able to statistically audit our CMDB as a part of your purple team exercise. So what is your visibility? Um, if you haven't heard of the DETECT framework, uh, they used the same naming convention as MITRE did, but it's a different thing. Three takeaways, right? What can my blue team see against what those logs are driven by what the threat behaviors are coming into it? This is where we cannot use MITRE ATT&CK as a bingo card to do that. We need to build the periodic elements into a chemical equation because those are the detections and the visibility we want to see. Um, I recently got to see a client who had built years on an atomic framework. I'm not going to say which one. It was not Atomic Red Team, but it was on a bingo card approach. And we ran one test and it saw nothing. That's the result from a visibility perspective when you focus solely on atomic pieces because it's not realistic enough to build a behavioral focused detection mechanism. So remember that periodic table? What water looks like. I also just really like this picture. It kind of gives me a Zen moment. And the one part that I think people don't realize is everybody focuses on the wave. A lot of what the artist was trying to do was actually show the juxtaposition of the giant mountain in the background against the wave. So response. What is the key measurement of response? Come on, I already gave you the answer. Time, time, right? So we need to measure time. And this is part of the effectiveness of a purple team because we're building collaboration through the purple team process. Again, we can go broader than red and blue. Has anybody ever done a security champions program? How did it go for you, Mike? <laughs> They're hard. It's actually easier to do a purple team than it is to do a security champions program, right? Recruiting these people, keeping them interested, actually getting a benefit from it as a challenge. Bring them into your purple team exercises as a reward. That is a great way to educate them. Look, the rest of the world does not know that you do not live Hollywood every day. Even in the blue team, they think you're doing elite hacker stuff and it's super cool. Bring them into a purple team and let them see the super cool stuff. It's the same way that blue feels when they get to see red activities. Oh, that's how a threat does that. That's really interesting. I guarantee you the person from HR is gonna feel the same way or business operations or finance. You're building collaboration and at the same time, our focus is on measuring response, which is the time aspect. You are not going to beat an attacker on technical visibility. You can beat them by being trained to time with realistic behavior. One of the coolest hypotheses I have right now is that attack chains overlap. I will never promise you you can catch zero day because you can't. There will always be a way in. But I can promise you with the behavioral focus over time, you're going to start catching attacks N plus steps. You're not going to catch step one most likely but you are gonna find there's a lot of commonality in the initial reconnaissance that an attacker does at step one, two, three, four, five, six. And your stronger controls are gonna be what detects that. When a attacker has to discover is when they're most vulnerable because it requires them to make noise. So this is where behavioral detection and time work to your back, your advance. And what is the worst feeling in the world? If the second worst feeling is going to the logs during an incident and they're not there, the worst feeling in the world is going to a backup that's not there or doesn't work. Yeah. So test your backups, right? This is the recovery aspect. Impact has happened. What's my ability to do forensic understanding? So the purple team doesn't mean I have to clean up from the purple team. Maybe I leave the artifacts there and I'm able to measure the forensic response. Maybe part of the outcome of that outside of the collaborative exercise is measuring the ability to recover. Um, some tie-ins I talked earlier about how business looks at disaster recovery and business continuity planning is their understanding. The recovery aspect of a purple team ties right into that and is your way of being business focused with, again, the worst feeling in the world. 
and I finished right on time.